so now let's take a look at some of the organisms that evolved in the Triassic, um, which I'm going to stop with you guys right before dinosaurs because I'd so much rather cover that in person when I get back. So um, some of our invertebrates here that evolve are our cnidarians, which remember our corals almost got wiped out at the Permian extinction event. So now we see our modern corals, which are called scleractinian corals. Um, and they become really common in the Tethys Ocean, um, and then they just kind of spread from there. So really, any modern coral that you can think of is just this last surviving group of corals, which we call um, sclerotinian corals. And it's really these group of corals that um, rely on algae to survive, um, which is why they have to live in that warm, clear water because the algae is photosynthetic, and that's what gives the corals oxygen. And so that really only develops with this line of corals. We start to see some terrestrial invertebrates come around. All of these things, well, most of these things on this list we've talked about, but in the oceans before. And now we're going to see some air-breathing snails, which if you've ever had a garden, you are definitely greatly annoyed by them. We can see freshwater snails, freshwater clams, crustaceans, ostracodes, conostrachins, notostrachins, lots of worms. Um, we're going to see some spiders, millipedes, and centipedes. Of course, these things aren't going to be as common as they were in the Paleozoic, um, but they are definitely still here and still kicking. We see our amphibians um, do some new things during this time. So remember, amphibians really had their heyday in the uh, Carboniferous, but when the reptiles um, evolved the amniotic egg, they became more dominant. Um, but our list amphibia, these are the ones that basically survived the Permian extinction. So these are our more modern amphibians. Um, so the amphibians that survive, uh, the list amphibia come from them. So we have three list amphibia. We have the anurians, which are our frogs and toads, which this is the earliest known frog uh, from Madagascar, which I've actually um, been extremely lucky to have worked on some of these fossils. Our Eurydelians are our salamanders and newts, which living in New Orleans, you've probably seen a salamander around. And our third are the celians, which are our limbless amphibians. They look like giant earthworms, but they aren't. Uh, they're actually amphibians. Our marine reptiles evolve at this time, which it is important to remember that these are not dinosaurs, okay? These are a different lineage. And here's what's really cool. So remember, amphibians evolved essentially from a line of fish, right? Or cross octorygians. Remember we talked about um, them needing to move from one basin to another, from one evaporitic basin to another basin to another basin. That's basically where walking comes from. So we talked about Tiktaalik and we talked about all that. So we had this great migration from water-dwelling organisms to land-dwelling. Now for the first time we have a reptile going back to the ocean. Okay, so we kind of have a backwards evolution. So we're going to see that these reptiles are going to have to acquire essentially aquatic traits, which is extremely different, right? So we're going to see that they're going to need to have paddle-shaped limbs, more streamlined body. Um, they're going to have to modify their lungs. These are, these are air-breathing organisms, Right? So they're going to have to modify their lungs um, to be able to hold in that air at a higher capacity. And we're going to see that some of them have reproductive modifications where they give birth to live young, or like sea turtles, right, where they go back to a certain spot to lay their eggs. So some of our marine reptiles that evolve um, are the first group are the nothosaurs. These are the first to go back into the sea. You can see that their limbs here definitely have five fingers and five toes, uh, but they are fairly paddle-shaped, but you can definitely see how these came from land-dwelling organisms for sure. Then we have our placodonts, which are basically big, fat, roaming tanks in the water. They are not very streamlined at all. Um, you can see the five fingers, five toes. Um, these guys had blunt teeth, which look like this, which means that they were crushing shells in between them. So these are definitely shell crushers. Then we have one of my favorite groups, which are the crocodiles. Um, the crocodiles were definitely the last important group of marine reptiles to evolve. Um, they were very rare by the time we get to the Cretaceous, and of course they're extremely rare today. 
Uh, do remember that there's only one spot in North America where we can actually find um, crocodiles, right? And that's in the Everglades. But crocodiles just got to a insane size um, during the Mesozoic. So here we have Sarcosuchus. Um, Sarcosuchus is just huge. Um, here, Sarcosuchus is standing next to a person that's six feet tall. So it's just it's mind-blowing how big this crocodile got. Um, here we have a reconstruction of Sarcosuchus, uh, the mold, or the cast all put together. And here's the paleontologist that found Sarcosuchus standing next to him. So you can just really see how huge um, this crocodile is. It's, it's really quite astounding. I'm very glad they don't get to that size today. So what we're going to see for our reptiles is we're going to have this group called archosaurs um, that are here. And archosaurs can be divided into two groups. Our lepidosaurs, which are all of our lizards and snakes and modern um, guys. And then our archosaurs, which are dinosaurs, pterosaurs, and crocodiles, and birds. Um, some archosaurs are around in the Triassic, but we call those basal archosaurs because they're kind of the base of this group, and then everything kind of evolves from this point. So one basal archosaur we can look at is our phytosaurs, which phytosaurs kind of artificially look like crocodiles. You can see these teeth. These are definitely, um, this is definitely a fish eater. Um, but what makes it very different from the crocodile is the position of the nose. That's what gives it away. So here if we take a look, uh, let's orient ourselves to the skull. Here we have the eye. Back here we have the dias diaspid condition. So we have the upper hole and the lower hole. Of course here we have the sinus cavity. And then here we have the nose. So you can see the nose is in between the eyes. With crocodiles, remember the nose is at the tip of the snout. So this is quite different. Here we have another phytosaur, and you can see the nose there up in between the eye. So even though they have very similar body um, shapes, this is what we call convergent evolution, um, they are actually quite different. And this is where we're going to end, and I'm going to pick back up uh, when I come back because we are then going to talk about dinosaurs. And I do want to take more time to talk about this um, because the actual definition of our different groups of dinosaurs is changing and evolving as we kind of understand things a little bit better.